things. And then we also have these geographic problems that the, that the facility picks out. Essentially what it's looking for is consistency. If you have a pair of coordinates and they fall in a, and you can see on the map that they fall in this municipality, this state, and this country. But if you look at the data record and it states a different country, like if the data record says Brazil, but the coordinates fall in Chile, there's a problem. So this is again a way of kind of exploring your data. Not the only facility. Uh, you can look at the accumulation. This is kind of inside this page. You can look at the accumulation of records. And then you can also look at how you have fixed the problems. So here there was an initial 2,000 suspicious genera. Somebody went in there and fixed them all, but then more records came online and somebody went in and fixed most of those. And all of the duplicate records, somebody went in and took care of those, but then it looks like one or two snuck in at the end. Okay, so this is kind of data cleaning, which is an ongoing, uh, never-ending process. Then we can go on to data integration. I'm giving you all Brazilian examples in, in honor of two of our, of our experts. Uh, this is the Species Link Network. This is just Brazil, 251 collections, 5.2 million records, of which just less than half are georeferenced, and they refer to 393,000 names. Some of those are synonyms, some of those are errors, okay? But a lot of names, a lot of records of a lot of biodiversity. And this is what the Brazilian world looks like. Each one of these circles and squares is a contributor. There's a hub in a city called Campinas. And from there, the data are served back to all of Brazil and to the whole world. So again, it's a, it's a ton of data. So then when we start having a critical mass of data, then we want to do interesting things with those data. So one of the things we want to do is to start to integrate the data. This is, a, this is talking about VertNet, which is uh, the four vertebrate uh, classes or traditional classes, uh, basically linking all US uh, providers, all US natural history museums, and a lot of the observational data. And essentially, what VertNet has done is to enable all those data with a lot of the things I've just shown you, but then also starts to, to do the integration stuff with things like uh, standardized vocabularies. It's no good if I write on my tag South Africa, but Karim writes on his tag RSA, and somebody else might write it in Dutch, okay? We need to start standardizing so that the data are usable. And you're going to see this, especially Wednesday, maybe Tuesday as well, you're going to see this as you start to play with the available knowledge about your countries. And what you're going to see is there's tons of problems in there. Tons and tons of problems. So as I said, it's an exciting time for biodiversity informatics. There are lots of possibilities, but again, there's lots to do. I'm going to give you a short example from Mexico. Don't worry, Adolfo, I'm not going to use the atlas very much. Uh, Maybe use my example so I will leave. <laughs> Adolfo's looking for an excuse to go see Cape Town and penguins and lions and things like that. Uh, this is a project that Adolfo and I started, I believe, in 1990 or 1991. Um, we had final text on the large book-length publication of the Distributional Atlas of Mexican Birds in 2001, because we were stuck in Beijing for nine days, and we read and edited the whole manuscript in that period. I really don't know why 12 years later we haven't yet published the atlas, other than the fact that we're both busy. But Adolfo and his group began things 
back in the late 80s, early 90s. And it was just an effort to get information on Mexican birds together in one place. Just trying to have that information together. And so the first step was bibliography. And so there was this big push to make photocopies, to buy books, but essentially to get access to the whole literature. And so they published this bibliography that was a fairly comprehensive summary of everything written about Mexican birds from 1825 to 1992. I started working with Adolfo in 1988, and I remember very clearly sitting and saying, well, where's that paper? How about this book? And you know, both of us were pulling our hair out because there simply wasn't access to the information. Now, 20 some years later, what we've done is not only compile the bibliography, but now all of the basic primary specimen data. So this is 412,000 records of Mexican birds held in the natural history museums of the world. If you look at annual numbers of records, it's kind of what you expect. Early, not much. Middle, more. We see an interruption for the, the First World War and we see more and more data accumulating. Oh, sorry. So there's kind of the cumulative number, and you can see above 400,000 records. The funny thing about this project is because it's taken 20 years to complete, it's now outdated because what we have is a centralized database. And when you centralize data, you pull it away from the source. And so if somebody back in one of the collections is updating identifications or georeferencing the data. We don't know about it. Okay, so we're, we have the whole wrong technology. And in fact, VertNet now takes care of about two thirds of this data set. So in a way, what we ought to do is publish the book and then erase the whole file because it's the wrong technology. But what we did let's say it was 82 natural history museums, fewer than half of those were digital. And fewer than half of those, could we just go to the curator and say, could we please have all of the records of Mexican birds from your data set? In more than 40 cases, what we had to do was go to the museum and capture the data. And that reality is something that's really big in Africa. For whatever reason, North American museums have jumped into computerization big time. Okay, the bird collection that I'm in charge of was computerized as of 1983. Okay, very, very, very early. European museums have not really gotten into this yet. And a reality for Africa is that most of the North American museums, most of the time, were collecting in the New World, and most of the collecting in Africa in the colonial era was done by Europeans. And so if you go to the British Museum, you're going to see vanishingly few of the data records uh, digitized. Vanishingly few. Um, and so that challenge of data capture actually becomes a big thing for Africa. Even in Mexico, there's another phenomenon we ought to talk about. If you take all the records in the Mexican atlas, all 420,000, only this chunk, those are the colors of the Mexican flag, by the way, green, white, and red, only that chunk from here to here is held in Mexican institutions. All the rest is here and there around the world. So it becomes kind of a global effort. It's not the sort of thing that you can just do at your institution or in your country. Each one of these pieces of the pie is a different natural history museum 
in a different city somewhere on Earth. The dynamic in Mexico is that early on, look at these blue columns, early on the collectors were European. So we're talking before 1900. By the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, North America dominates. And then by the end of the 20th century and into the present, Mexico dominates. So all the new specimens tend to be held in Mexican institutions. But all of the old specimens, and in fact the three quarters or more of the specimens are held outside of Mexico. And finally, am I using all the material you're going to present tomorrow? <laughs> Finally, we can look at how this translates into science. 